Good morning. We're glad you guys are here. Daniel and I had a chance to meet most of you. Um, we're from Indian Bible College in Flagstaff. We also have some more IBC folks back there. This is Tim and Chelsea and Atreus and Michael. You're going to hear from, you probably hear from Atreus spontaneously during this time, but you hear from the rest of them uh, by way of testimony. So, um, I'm glad you're here, and we're gonna we're gonna talk. We're gonna do we're doing the same presentation for the first 30 minutes, and then the last 30 minutes is unique testimony. So we had different students sharing last night. We'll have different students sharing later today, um, and then a Q&A time. So 30 the first 30 minutes of each workshop are the the same. The last 30 minutes are kind of more of a free for all. So and I'll hand it to Daniel. All right. Yeah, well, good morning, everybody, and uh, so glad that you can make it out to uh, the workshop here. Um, as Jason mentioned, my name is Daniel uh, Esplin. This is my wife, Kareen, and uh, so she is not here this weekend, but uh, we both work and serve at the Indian Bible College there in Flagstaff. And uh, so uh, my wife is Seneca, uh, from the Seneca tribe back in New York State, western New York, right outside of uh, Buffalo, between Buffalo and uh, Rochester. So uh, that's where she grew up, and uh, so the Senecas are known for uh, their fierce tenacity. They were the tribes who used to to scalp uh, people. So I, I try not to get my wife too uh, too upset. So, <laughs> and uh, um, I'm from the Navajo Nation um, here in Arizona, and uh, I always say the Navajos are the peaceful tribe, but my wife would differ from that too. So. <laughs> um, Primarily, I am the director of admissions, so I do a lot of recruitment for the college. I go out and uh, visit various uh, conferences, camps, uh, churches, um, and high schools, um, just sharing about Indian Bible College. And, um, and uh, secondarily, I do teach a class on biblical manhood. We call it the Native Masculinity Collaborative. Um, generally speaking, you know, Native men um, over the years were the pro providers and the protectors for their families and communities. But uh, over the generations, um, our Native men have just been emasculated by uh, fatherlessness, uh, domestic violence, uh, alcohol addictions, um, and, and so forth. And uh, so this class is helping our men look to Jesus as the model for masculinity, how he embraced his role, his responsibilities, and live, live for the glory of God. And uh, so uh, my wife is a dean of women. She has a passion for... Uh, just mentoring and investing her time and energy in the lives of Native women. So um, uh, when when the Lord um, uh, when, when she gave her life to the Lord, my wife um, told God, you know, Lord, I don't want to uh, I don't want to work with Native peoples. You know, send me send me somewhere, send me to Italy, send me to you know somewhere um, far away from Native peoples. But um, it's funny how God works. But God. Uh, now has sent her to work with Native peoples and is, is spending her, her life investing in that. So, But she, she loves it. And uh, Same for me. Um, I got saved in 2001 and uh, I said, God, I, I'm only, I, just want, I want to go to Bible college, but Lord, I don't want to be a missionary. And uh, I just want to learn more about you and I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to be a full-time missionary, but um, now I'm a full-time missionary serving at Indian Bible College. So that's a little bit about us. So, uh, in the white way, you introduce yourself by what you do, but I actually think the native way is better. You introduce yourself by your relationships. So, uh, this is my little albino clan, um, my little pale fa bunch of pale faces, and one of them sitting back there, my son David's the youngest, and I'll tell a, I'll tell a story about him in a minute. Um, but uh, <laughs> I, I grew up in a town named for a native tribe. But I never saw or felt the needs of Native people, and also the opportunities, that, like we'll talk about this morning, uh, until God brought me to Indian Bible College 14 years ago to, to become the president of, of the college now. Um, I grew up wanting to be a missionary, and uh, um, actually have a pre-med degree in my under, for my undergraduate, thought I'd be a medical missionary overseas, but instead of medical school, I went to seminary, then got my doctorate, um, and became a local church pastor. When my wife... Uh, when she grew up, she was also wanting to be a missionary. When she met me, I was a pastor, so, so she settled. If I can't have a missionary, pastor will have to do for us. <laughs> so um, when God called, brought us to actually help plant a church here in Phoenix, um, that then emerged with another church, is now, and now is New City Church. We helped plant one of the two churches that became New City uh, in north, north downtown. Uh, the Lord used that to bring us two years later in 2008 to, to Indian Bible College um, 
and I love serving Native people and hope to do so the rest of our lives, not because, just because they're polite, but even more because of the potential, and we'll talk about that this morning. The gospel, Native people have a platform for the gospel that I think maybe no other culture on the planet has, and, and, and we'll unpack that in a minute. Um, I have three younger sisters, and I always wanted a younger brother, didn't get one. We started having kids, we had a girl, we had another girl, we had another girl. Now, I have a chemistry major from my undergraduate, right? I know how to do math. And I did the math, decided that God didn't trust me with little boys. So when the ultrasound technician said, you're having a son for your fourth child, I said, check again. God wouldn't do this, that to this kid. <laughs> he knows I'd mess him up somehow. But the really good news, and this kind of lighthearted away from my own story, to, it illustrates a very important principle. Not, what's trending does not define the mind of God. Just because something has been happening doesn't mean God's going to continue to keep it happening, nor does he necessarily want it to happen if it's a story of brokenness. And as we're going to talk about this morning, hundreds of years of gospel witness amongst native peoples, and they're still the mission field right within our own lands. It's one of the world's greatest failures of the Great Commission, and it's right within our own borders, and any Bible college is committed to seeing that change. And uh, and we're partnering with other native ministries. Before we get done, we'll show you some of the other Arizona-based Native American ministries that we're in relationship with. Um, just to encourage you, if the Lord's leading you in some way to get involved, there are lots of options. We're certainly not the only one, but we just, we're the ones that have the privilege of being able to speak on behalf of Native ministries. Missions in Our Own Backyard is the title of this track, and, and I never saw the, the need for missions in my own backyard. I'm so thankful God didn't take my wife on overseas, but brought us to a people that uh, have great potential for their own people, but also for the world. So... So just a quick question. How, how many tribes do you, do you think are in uh, America? 365. Anybody else? 365. Who else? 525. Anybody else? A lot. A lot. 574. 574 federally recognized tribes. And uh, yeah, um, so each of those tribes, as you can see, are are um, are on this map here. This includes uh, Alaska as well. So um, um, most of the tribes, um, some of them do uh, kind of overlap as far as like the uh, Ojibwe tribes, um, like in Wisconsin, uh, Minnesota, all the way up to North Dakota, sometimes into Montana. Um, you know, there's different bands of Ojibwe's. Uh, same thing for Lakota Sioux. Uh, Lakota Sioux. There's different bands of, of Lakota Sioux too. But um, as I mentioned, I'm from the Navajo Nation. Um, so 22 of those tribes reside in Arizona. I don't know if you've, I don't know if you've, if you, if you've known that. Most most folks know Navajo, Hopi, and Apaches here in in Arizona. But there, there are 22 tribes right in our backyard, and that th- I think that's what excites me about about you coming to this workshop. It's, it's just to see what 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 are some of the mission feel mission feels right in our backyard. And uh, so uh, California has the most uh, tribes of any state. As you can see, they're kind of uh, peppered around, um, around the state. But the states with the most native populations are California, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, and Oklahoma. So God has strategically kind of placed us in this area um, need as well. Uh, generally speaking, um, I talked about the, the, um, the class that I lead on, on uh, biblical manhood, but generally speaking, you know, native men, um, are, have just been emasculated. And, uh, but looking, looking at this map, I mean, most of, most of the tribes are, are led by the women. And, um, uh, there's a lot of, uh, addictions, um, uh, alcoholism, child abuse is two times higher than, than the national average. Uh, teen suicide is three times higher. In Alaska, those numbers are even higher, and this is pre-COVID as well. Um, in Alaska, teen suicide is ten times higher than the national average. So, um, uh, one of the biggest obstacles when sharing the gospel to Native peoples, one of the biggest obstacles that, that, that Native peoples um, always say is, you know, that, that Christianity is Christianity is a white man's religion. And uh, but you and I know that's that's far from the truth, right? Jesus was not a white man. Jesus did not have blue uh, blue eyes and blonde hair, right? He was uh, he was a tribal man. He came from the tribe of Judah. And um, but native peoples have have continued to 
believe this 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 stereotype, this lie of who Jesus is. And um, but we're hoping to change that. And um, so, but it's kind of neat just to see where Native peoples reside and uh, some of the some of the things that we that we uh, that we face as well. So we're going to kind of dive into that a little more as well. So. And as I mentioned, we're going to take some time for question and answers at the end. So because we're moving through a lot of information very fast, and, and that, that, but the Q&A at the end gives you a chance to dive into something you want to hear more on, of the why and the what and so on. We're going to kind of start by talking a little bit about the plight, and then we'll move on to talking about the potential. And when Columbus landed in 1492, there were somewhere between 5 and 20 million Native Americans in the contiguous 40, um, you know, 48 states. The U.S. Census found 237,000 in 1900. Now, that's a population decimation over the course of those four centuries. Praise God that, that, that that's been changing. The re- reversal, there's a, well, actually one of the fastest growing demographics in the United States. 20, uh, 50% of the population is under the age of 25. So there's a lot, it's a very young, very youth culture, a lot of babies. Um, <clears throat> speaking of babies, bye, Trace, come back. See you soon. <laughs> um, and uh, however, uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, very much still the mission field um, for those 574 tribes. If you're looking for a tribe that has thriving churches that can, se- that can send their best and brightest to other tribes, let alone around the world, you're going to spend a lot of time looking. Um, it doesn't exist. And so it is uh, one of the world's greatest failures of the Great Commission right within our own borders. Daniel's wife, Kareen, uh, as well as Daniel, have been on dozens of reservations. Kareen's the one that introduced me to this phrase, that the reservations are Satan's playground. And so Daniel's going to unpack that a little bit more related to some of the, those, those challenges. Yeah. So one of my recruitment trips uh, last month sent me, sent me to Wisconsin, Minnesota, North and South Dakota, and Montana. And, um, but just, just to continue to see how Satan has continually kept Native people in bondage, just to see the, uh, the poverty... The hopelessness, the um, you know, just that that hardness to the gospel, and um, a lot of things you see here are just uh, maximized. It's almost an extension of uh, inner city, you know, um, trauma among among native peoples, and uh, it's it's not uncommon for students to come to the college, or if you were to run into a young person, uh, 10 to 15 years old, who has been through numerous forms of abuse. Um, and uh, I, I mentioned I mentioned some of these numbers as well, but um, I think it's just I think I think one thing that Satan knows and and tries to keep um, uh, is the fact that I think Satan knows that Native peoples can be a force for the gospel, you know, and uh, we're gonna unpack that a, a little more as well, but. Um, physical abuse, verbal abuse, uh, sexual abuse, spiritual, and so forth. Um, you probably heard a little bit about the boarding schools. Um, uh, historically, Native peoples were either forcibly removed or attended boarding schools across the country. And um, I mean, I've never attended a school. And some people often, some would say, you know, that 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 didn't affect you, but it did affect my my dad. It did it did affect my mom. So the way they raised us uh, affected us as, as well. Um, you probably heard of, um, you know, uh, the boarding schools up in Canada as well. Um, but just some of those trauma that Native people have been walking through, and I think one of the things we're helping our students is at an Indian Bible College is not a, not only just learning theology, but learning how to walk through healing. You know, learning how to experience the healing that God provides, and and so that they're able to take that and share that with other people. Um, so I uh, talked about a little poverty and, and unemployment as well. Number of Christians. Um, there was a reputable um, Christian man in Oklahoma that once said uh, there's less than 5% uh, of Christians among Native America. Less than 5%. Think about that. That's after hundreds of, hundreds of years of missionary activity in this country that there are still less than 5% that are followers of Jesus. And even those who pro, pro, uh, um, um, what's, what's the word? Um, profess to be Christians, there are very few who want to devote themselves to ministry. So um, uh, that's kind of a little bit of the uh, state of the church and the number of Christians in that area. Thanks, Daniel. Yeah, if, um, Jesus says in John 10.10 10, that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He has come that we might have life, eternal life, 
and have it abundantly. In, in, in really broad strokes, evangelism is to bring people into eternal life. Uh, discipleship is to bring people into abundant life. To walk in everything that's available to us in Christ Jesus. The finished work of Christ ultimately has to be lived into in our obedience and what we call sanctification. And um, But uh, the reality is, is that every one of our students comes with eternal life, but many of them, if not most of them, have never even tasted or even seen what it looks like to see abundant life. Um, close to 100% of our students have had one of these forms of abuse. Many have had several. Um, one national study said that it's 79% of young Native women have been sexually abused or assaulted. And our experience is that's low. It's closer to 90 or 95%. Uh, now, that's just one example of how broken the Native family has become because of the reservation system and then the boarding schools uh, and the effects, really the effects of European settlement and manifest destiny. And so when I was sitting in my living room here in Chandler, Arizona, I actually just lived right up the road for this church planning effort in 2008, I was weeping one day for, the, for some of these dynamics, these realities, things I didn't even know at that point, but just so broken for the, the teen suicide rate being three times the rest of the country, the hopelessness and those kinds of things. Um, then the next day I looked in the mirror and I just wanted to punch myself. <laughs> I wanted to go punch, punch the first white guy I saw, and that, and that was me. Um, now, I want to be clear. I'm not talking about white guilt. I'm talking about Christian responsibility. Because as, well, as, as, as if you understand the history of missions amongst Native peoples, praise God, they brought the gospel, but unfortunately they brought it in the worst of, of a kind of a colonialistic Western way. The, not too many college presidents are having this much fun on their heads, all right? If you forget my name, you can call me President Harry. Um, this is for my wife. She likes being married to a Viking mountain man. I don't understand it. But this is for our students, and this is my walking lament for the hundreds of years of bad haircuts to Native men. Because for, it's symbolic in so many ways of, of how we're committed to reversing and, and even remedying some of those wrongs where for so many years, if a native man would come to Christ, come to boarding school, want to come to church, first thing the missionaries would do is cut his hair based upon one bad interpretation of one verse in 1 Corinthians 11. Um, and that's very much systemic throughout the history of missions amongst native people. It's very much why there's such a rejection even of, of Christianity to this day. But that weeping that I, and, and weeping followed by righteous anger that I felt in the spring of 2008 before God, as part of God calling us to Indian Bible College has been surpassed by excitement for the, the potential of Native people. Because as, as we all know, the most effective way to reach a group of people is to, to train them to reach and to lead their own, right? To, to help people come into eternal life through evangelism, walk an abundant life through discipleship. Um, and so I'm so thankful God didn't take my wife and I overseas, but brought us, you know, like we had originally planned, but brought us to this people group because there is such an opportunity for the gospel around the world. And this is why I think Native Americans are maybe Satan's favorite people in this land. He's absolutely determined to keep them oppressed, uh, un unsaved and certainly undiscipled. Um, <clears throat> and because the Native people have more doors open for the gospel, maybe than any other people group on the planet. There's a worldwide fascination with Native culture, worldwide compassion and empathy with their history. To come to Christ as a Native American is very similar to what a Muslim goes through in terms of loss of identity, family troubles, rejection, you know, ostracization, those kinds of things. And the unreached peoples on the planet, with the gospel, the scriptures in their own language, they're most of the time tribal, often even indigenous peoples in their own lands. Who better to help finish the job of seeing every tongue, every tribe, every nation hearing the gospel than the original inhabitants of this land? And I don't think restoration looks any better for Native peoples than seeing healthy Native leaders leading healthy Native churches that they might someday send healthy Native missionaries to other tribes, but ultimately around the world. So we talk about uh, training Native Americans to reach and lead their own. It's one of the smartest ways, one of the greatest needs in the country, but also one of the greatest opportunities around the world. Daniel and his wife started something called A Natives to France in one of the least Christian countries in Europe. And, and maybe you can just talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So France is, uh, I don't know if you guys know, but there's, there's less, less than 1% of Christians in that country. And, uh, but God opened a door for us to take some, some students out to France. And uh, um, so what, what we do is uh, we, we get to share uh, uh, cultural presentations there. And uh, for some reason, when we go out, when we go out of the country, we're like rock stars, and uh, <laughs> and uh, people are just fascinated with 
our culture. And uh, so they first think that we're uh, from Colombia or from uh, down in South America. But when they find out that we're Native Americans, I mean, they just they, they are just amazed. But France only knows um, kind of the stereotypical idea of Native peoples, you know, teepees and horses and, and all that stuff. So a lot of it is educational. We get to tell them, you know, a little bit about our outfits and jewelry and different things about that. But we, we just talk to them, too, that, you know what, we, we use cell phones. We don't use smoke signals anymore, you know. <laughs> we ride cars. We drive in cars. No more horses. And... Uh, but at the end of each presentation, we get to share the gospel. We get to share our story. Um, and uh, so the, Fre- the French are just, they're, they're confused. How can you be Native American and Christian? They expect, they expect us to hate Christianity. And, um, but uh, the, Fren- the, the, the French are, um, you know, they see um, Christianity, they see any religion as more of like, that's for the lower class people. You know, that's more, that's more, for, the, more for the dumb people. But for us to come there and just share um, the hope of Jesus, and uh, so God's really opened the opportunity. We're able to do that in Spain as well. And I think going back to what to what Jason said about um, open doors, um, I didn't really believe that, honestly. When Jason shared one time, he said Native peoples can be some of the most powerful missionaries since the apostles. I said. That's not true. You ha- you have to say that because you you're the president of a, of a of a Bible college. You know you have to say something nice. And um, but I honestly didn't believe that. And uh, but after going out there and seeing that God is opening doors, using um, you know somebody from a small community from a reservation, using what I was ashamed of, using what I was you know what I think is is useless um, for His glory. And uh, I think that's what excites me. Not just the plight of Native Americans, but the potential that Native, that Native people can be for the gospel. So our, because of the needs and the opportunities, the plight and the potential, our mission is to, to disciple and educate in that order. We're not just about fill heads, but change lives. We even tell our prospective students, applicants, if you just want a Bible college degree, don't come here. That's not who we are. If you want to become more like Jesus, more the person he's created and called you to be, including walking into that abundant life uh, in a holistic way, then, then that's who we are. For biblical ministry and spiritual leadership to their people, but also even then to the world. And so we do... Um, not just an accredited certificate, associate's and bachelor's degree, but we do abuse recovery and discipleship and leadership training. Our goal is to, before a student gets their bachelor's degree, to be trustworthy enough with a shepherd's heart to lead discipleship groups of their younger peers. Um, and vocational entrepreneurial training, because the reservation is a welfare state. And so dependency and entitlement is, is, is the natural result of that. And we want students to be able to take responsibility and bring business and mission even back to the reservations in the name of Jesus to open doors for the gospel. <clears throat> um, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You're at a missions conference. You, you know, you, this is the, one of the classic missionary verses, right? And one of the sending passages. All four gospels and the book of Acts have a sending passage. This is the one in Acts. But you will receive power and the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and to the ends of the earth. Is that what it says? Is there anything missing? Ah, good. Last night they didn't get it. I, and then they were all mad at me because I tricked them. Like, no, I don't want to believe anything else you said. Kind of like Dad, as I told you, I sh- you shouldn't believe anything I said because I have to say that as the president. <laughs> um, Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria to the ends of the earth. We have so often le- leapt over Samaria to go to the ends of the earth. Who are the Samaritans of Jesus' day? Well, it was a cross-cultural ministry field right within their own borders with, who, with whom there had been tremendous mistreatment, hostility, even prejudice. And Jesus says, don't you dare forget Samaria to go to, in go, the process of going to the ends of the earth. But we have failed the Samaria of our land in helping them have thriving native leaders leading thriving native churches that they can join us in the Great Commission. That's part of the reason we're here, and we're really excited to be at Mission Connection. Actually, Daniel and uh, his wife, Corrine, were at Mission Connection in Portland before it even got started here. Um, so we have a connection to this, and we're committed not just to helping you get, you get to know the opportunities for missions in your own backyard, but helping our students get engaged and have a global mindset, global perspective. Part of the reason I brought my, my sidekick bodyguard this morning, because I want him to have a heart for the world, global perspective. Um, and ultimately, someday, for Native peoples to be a part of that. So our vision is to see Native America cease to be the mission field, become part of the missions force. 
from emissions field to emissions force is our, uh, is our, is our vision statement. There's a lot of good intentions, but really bad methods being done even today in the missions amongst native tribes and reservations. So if you're interested in getting involved in, in reservation ministry, make sure you're doing it in a way that doesn't facilitate dependency and doesn't do for native people what they can and should be doing for themselves. On the Navajo Reservation, the joke is summer is called white van season. Do you know why it's called white van season? You know what churches drive? White vans. <laughs> the Asian and white churches that come in to serve Native people are typically in white vans. And, and so much, I would say more than half of what's being done is causing more harm than hurt because they're, doing, they're not raising up leaders to train their own people to do for themselves and reducing and eliminating that dependency and entitlement. So... Um, any other comments before we have some testimonies? Yeah. You want to elaborate? I just wanted to kind of add on to this. I, I think this is the one thing that really uh, gets me up every morning, you know, is, is, is to see uh, Native peoples uh, come from a missions field to a missions force. And um, I think that's one thing that really excites me about, about what uh, Billy Graham also said. Um, there's a quote that he mentioned um, years ago. He says, the greatest moments of Native history lie ahead of us if a great spiritual renewal and awakening should take place. He says, the Native American has been a sleeping giant. He is awakening. The original Americans could become the evangelists who will help win America for Christ. Remember these forgotten people. And um, I just, I, I love that, what he said. And, um, but I, I often say too, I, I just don't want to become known as a sleeping giant. You know, a sleeping giant is just that, a sleeping giant. But I want to be the giant who wakes up and engages in the mission force and uh, so that's what excites me as, as for you guys to be here too just to, 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 to be a part of this project because we, we believe we're not the silver bullet we're better we're, we're, we're better stronger we're, we're better together so. Thanks, Dave. all right you guys going first or are you going you're gonna have Michael go first you know we, we didn't we obviously didn't decide our order ahead of time Oh, All right, Michael, come on up. Yeah, yeah nice try. <laughs> Michael's going to introduce himself and then just share a little bit of his story, and then we're going to hear from our married couple, Tim and Chelsea. Uh, and then we'll take some some further interaction for questions and answers. Uh, i got to put on the timer. I tend to talk a lot. Um, so... All right. So my name is Michael. I am from the Hopi Reservation. Um, yeah, uh, uh, from the Third Mesa uh, Village area. So in, I guess, wanting to tell my story, I kind of, I guess, want to fit it into what the whole presentation is, kind of uh, missions in your backyard, I think is what it's called. Um, yeah, so kind of keeping with that theme that I came to the, to the Lord um, when I was 18 years old. And it was kind of hard for me to do because before that, for the first 18 years of my life, I was really a traditional person, uh, partaking in all the ceremonies and stuff like that. But it became really hard for me because uh, I was doing what they wanted me to do. I was doing the ceremonies, I was praying what they wanted me to like pray, and I was singing the songs that they wanted me to sing. But at home, nothing changed. You know, I was always told that Hopi, if you live Hopi, things will you know be better. Things will be you know peaceful because that's what Hopi means. You know, peaceful people, but I always questioned it because as soon as I was doing all those stuff and I come home, I was like, well, then why is my why is my dad still an alcoholic? Like, why is he still abusive? And why is my mom still running around with other men? Like, I like I don't know what I'm doing wrong. <clears throat> and it became really frustrating because I am one of five children um, from my mom, and I'm the second oldest. But as the older boy they always looked to me for a lot of answers and I, I, I couldn't like live up to their expectations of trying to lead a family that you know I, I, I didn't even have good people in my life good role models and so the people who actually presented a Christ to me was a lady who was from within the United States you know my backyard of the United States <laughs> so she I was seven eight years old and I was just thinking about a lot of stuff and I, I honestly thoughts like that shouldn't have been in my mind at eight, eight years old and I told her, I was like, how do, you, how do you do it? You know, like, how are you so, like, happy and stuff? Like, what brought you here? And you're so far away from home. And she presented the gospel to me at that age. And I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> like that, then I 
continue to do my traditional stuff. And then at, when I was 16 years old, that's when I kind of gave my life to the to the Lord, like sort of, I guess I call it my free trial time. <laughs> well, mainly because like I was led to the Lord, and that was it, nothing else. And going with what they're saying, uh, native, leading another la- native, and you know helping them to lead other native. I didn't really have that because the people who led me to the Lord kind of just left, and I kind of had bitterness in my heart. But at 18, a guy he came to the reservation whose home was only like 30 minutes away, came to my reservation and became part of the youth group that I was a part of. And I was really thankful for him. And after five, six years, you know, he actually not only helped me ready to de- dedicate my life, but actually keep to it of Christ. And he was just there every step of the way, every question, every fall, every struggle that I had. Uh, I had, um, I had, I was just really thankful for him. And so, yeah, he, he came into my life. He led or helped me uh, kind of keep to his life because there were so many times I wanted to pull away and be with my traditional people. But then, yeah, I came to IBC because he, you know, recommended it because he was actually part of IBC. And so, like, yeah, I learning the stuff now, and now he kind of finally moved on, but I, I think, you know, he did his part. He came to our youth group and spoke into my life, and then now, like, it's, I feel like it's my turn now to go back to my people and do the same thing. So I'm really thankful for him and for IBC and for what they do. So. Thanks, Michael. <clears throat> All right. Well, we're going to now have a, a dynamic duo of Tim and Chelsea Silver Key. So, um, you guys both coming up together? I don't know how we're going to do this. <laughs> um, I can go first just for a couple minutes. Um, my name is Timothy Key. I am half Navajo, half um, white. And. Um, it's kind of different. My story, I, I didn't grow up in a traditional background um, of Native American. Mine was by my, uh, by my father, who was white, and um, my mom left us when, when I was like seven years old, so she took the language and everything else that comes with being Navajo. But we stayed on the reservation. My dad had a trailer out there with uh, me and my three sisters, and we grew up in the res life, is what they call it. No electricity, hauling water, just so... It's kind of funny. I, I I know a lot more about how to live on the reservation before actually knowing the traditional ways. I know some things, but um, my, it became really hard for my dad, a single father, working two jobs, couldn't support us all. He sent us all to boarding school in uh, Montezuma, which is in um, Camp Verde. And um, I did receive Christ there when I was like seven. I remember feeling completely different on the inside. And that is hard to say from for for a little boy to to feel that um and i and I was getting that affirmation from so many people on the outside telling me you're you're different now, but um they kept telling me when the when I would mess up just a little bit that I had lost my salvation, that I'm on my way back to hell that i'm you know might as well get a, a some floaties for the lake of fire because you know that's where I'm headed so um that really pushed me to, I can't live this. I'm, I'm not perfect. I cannot do it. So that led into, I started doing drugs when I was nine years old. Uh, I started drinking when I was um, 14, and that led on all the way up until I was 27. But when I was 22 years old, I met my wife here, Chelsea. Um, we obviously didn't get married as soon as we saw each other, which probably would have been better, but it didn't happen. <laughs> Actually, no, it wouldn't have been better. <laughs> so... Um, we had um, our first child. His name is Jacek. He's eight years old. He can't uh, be here. Um, he's already a handful, so I couldn't imagine having both. Um, so um, w- that was really terrible time. We really went through a lot of both being in the same aspect of drinking and doing drugs and, and just living that trend of darkness that the world offers. And it was it was really bad. Um, super thankful that God had brought us together um, through that and when we hit when we hit rock bottom more than once it was when I was 27 years old um, I couldn't do it anymore and she couldn't do it and we we were feeling the need to find something and the only answer that we were getting was you need Jesus you need God this is the only way and um, in 2019 
we actually, after you know, rededicating my life back to God, and of course my wife accepting um, Christ, Jason right there actually is the man that married us. Um, so that was an amazing um, time in our life, and and that led into going to IBC because I had all these questions, all these questions of what's going on with the Bible, this and this. And I remember asking. Why does it say the same thing in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John? Why have the, all these? And they said, you know, that's a great question. You should come to IBC. <laughs> and I'm like, just tell me. <laughs> so now I'm on this 30-year journey of uh, Indian Bible College. And they um, remember Daniel calling me one day. We were at Jason's house. And he said, hey, we got a house for you guys. So a little two-bedroom home. And we were able to move on campus. And um, we're the only family um, for a full-time student to stay there. So um, that's kind of uh, just two days ago was our th- three-year anniversary. So that was that was an amazing one. Been uh, free from alcohol for uh, five years um, in September and three and a half years fully sober. So it's it's really recent journey, but um, I'll, I'll give Chelsea a few minutes to talk about what she went through. Um. My name is Chelsea Silver. I am from Gallup, New Mexico, and um, I am part of the Navajo tribe, also known as the Diné. Um, I was raised traditional. Um, my grandparents were very traditional, and um, and so my mom and dad had tried to um, keep it as traditional as possible, but of course, modernization came through, and we kind of had to um, you know, go to school and stuff, but I do um, remember the people would come to our reservation in the bi- in the white van, <laughs> and my cousins and I we would go run to the woods because we didn't want to go, <laughs> and we go hide in the trees and like we're n- we're not home, we're, we don't want to go, um, and so I remember that, and I remember throughout my lifetime hearing um, or being approached um, from similar ladies of, um, like, they all looked the same to me. They were all white, and they've always came to me like, do you know who Jesus is? And I'm like, "Mm, I don't know. And they're like, do you want to know him? Do you want to accept him in your life? And it just, like, was so weird for me because it it was the same thing all the time. And I'm like, okay. um," And then it became, like, yeah, I know him. Yeah, I've been through this, and it was so weird, and so I really didn't understand it. Um, But I grew up um, in a very broken home. Um, My mom and dad are still together, but they definitely did not have it all together. I was exposed to a lot of domestic violence, a lot of child abuse. Um, I remember staying home with my siblings alone. Um, My dad wasn't there. He was an alcoholic and a drug addict and and he was very abusive towards my mother. And so I remember a lot of very, very vague memories of um, being exposed to a lot of things I shouldn't have been. Um, And so, Later on down the years, um, as I was growing up, I was trying to find out who I was, and um, I definitely should have went the other route, but I feel like God has led me on this path um, to have experienced a lot of the things that I did, Um, and I myself um, became very, very um, heavily addicted to drugs and alcohol, and I started at a very young age, um, and when Tim and I had got together, um, that was our life, just living very, very dark, and um, it got to the point where I was very suicidal. Um, I hated myself. I hated my life. I did not want to be in this world anymore, and um, we faced many trials and one of which was (laughs) I was in front of a judge and he was telling me Chelsea you gotta stop because you're looking at a few years in prison and I was like I can't do this Um, I already have a son who needs me and I just I know I need something else and 
through my traditional side, we I kept going to ceremonies to fix things, to um, make me whole again, to make the, me the person I needed to be, and I just could not find myself through those through through those things. And it was very heartbreaking that it was like, why isn't this working? Why aren't these prayers working? Why isn't these songs working? Like. They said it would work, and it it just wasn't. And it was um, like I had a void inside. And so we had um, Tim's family praying for us, and and I remember them telling us like we go to church, you should come. Um, and there was plenty of times when Tim would approach me with um, God and Jesus, and I'm like, I just I, I can't do that right now that's just I, I don't understand it and so um, I finally like we hit rock bottom and I was like okay I think I think we need something else and not knowing that it was Jesus calling us like and I have always said um, I'm calling on Jesus, but in one of his verses, he says, I have called you, not that you have called me. And I was just like, oh, that's so cool. <laughs> um, but we I finally was able to, to give in to that and actually have an ear for it. And then as soon as my ears opened up to that, um, my mind started racing with questions and then when I finally found truth and peace and, and hope and a faith that I never found ever before, my heart opened up to, to God and I, and I gave my life to Jesus. And it was the most fulfilling thing. And the, this walk has um, not made it easier. It's actually been a lot more challenging, but with his strength that he's provided with us, um, I, I don't think that I would have continued like at all this way, like stronger, because um, all of the other attempts I kept failing and falling and staying down, and it was just a repetitious thing. And I honestly feel like there has been, he has changed us in so many ways. And so it was amazing. <laughs> well done, guy. Chelsea, is that the first time showing your story in front of strangers? Um, a group of strangers. A group of strangers, I yeah. <laughs> well done. Good job. Thank you. <clears throat> One of the coolest parts of <clears throat> their wedding day was that they were both baptized. And got married and then took communion on the same day. So we just we did all three of the Christian ordinances in a pretty dynamic way. This is one of my favorite pictures of the last 14 years, um, and I hope there's a lot more pictures like this to come. On this particular day, we have four older white missionaries standing next to the four younger Native leaders that were to work that were taking their jobs, taking their roles. From right to left on that day, librarian, business administrator. A director of work, the vocational and spiritual side of things. And this white guy with a white tie, Roger Scarborough, is one of the most effective white missionaries amongst Native peoples, had led this Zuni Pueblo young man to Christ, discipled him, sent him to Bible college, helped support him through Bible college, and then two months after he graduated on this day, came back and took his job oh, wow. at the only church serving, serving the Zuni Pueblo. And the Pueblo peoples, some of them are less than 1% Christian, some of the least reached peoples even uh, in North America. And so um, my, my dream is to hand over my job to a Native American. I hope to be the last white president of the college. Uh, I'm only 49, so it's a few more years, a few more decades. Pray, pray for me that I can uh, <clears throat> be stubborn enough to last until the Lord brings that person to replace me. But I want to serve Native people the rest of my life. I'm so compelled by this plight, but even more so by the potential. Um, these are uh, just a few of the Arizona-based Native ministries here. Um, all of these uh, we are in relationship with, and you can find them. Um, through a website search, or we could be glad to make an introduction to the leaders of these, any or all of these as well. So um, I'll put the slide back up in a minute. And then uh, <clears throat> we're committed to being biblical first, relational second, and transformational third. I come from the least relational culture on the entire planet. 
Some of you do too. Yeah, if you've traveled around the world, you realize that every other culture besides Western, besides Anglo culture, Caucasian, is more family, communal, relationally oriented. And I think that it's imp- I, I know it has impacted our theology and especially our ecclesiology and the way we do, and even our missiology. We've derelationalized so much of the gospel which is not just the right forgiveness from sin, but a whole t- new way of living and a right relationship with God and, and reconciliation with, with Him and opportunity for that with others. And so in order for lives to be transformed, we have to teach the Word in the context of, of healthy community. So a huge part of our model is we, we are desperately committed to having healthy community because so many of our students have never experienced it from family or from church, but their people desperately need to see that for the sake of the gospel. So... Um, at that, with that, we're going to take some questions, and, uh, and Daniel's usually better at answering the questions than I am, so I'll hand it there, just to, we'll hand it back and forth based upon your questions or comments. Um, do you have people representing all, like, two um, historically, we've had more Navajos, um, represented at the college, only because of, uh, location, and, um, uh, sadly, the school used to be known as a Navajo Navajo College, but um, we've tried to change that and uh, make it more 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 diverse. And uh, so, um, but right now we have uh, probably in in the state of Arizona we have um, I would say five five to six at a time Navajo Hopi uh, different Apaches, the so different Apache bands. Um, we have a, you have a Yavapai Apache as well, and uh, yeah, so. Um, I'm just curious about, there's a little bit of Hopi on the reservation of the Navajo, but how, how does that, how do they work together, or do you work together? <laughs> I get confused, is that a yeah. complicated question? Yeah. Yeah. No, h- historically, uh, the Navajos and Hopis uh, used to be very, uh, they, they were enemies, they were enemies, and um, so um, there was a lot of, uh, um, as a Navajo, I can say this, <laughs> the Navajos, uh, since they were larger and used to, were kind of uh, more more of the bully on okay. the block, and uh, um, used to um, pick, pick on and take kind of steel uh, land and things away from the Hopis, and uh, so there was a lot of animosity there. Um, there kind of is in in, in some sense, um, but um, a lot of that has kind of faded away and stuff too. But the, I mean, there, there there are there are some there are some still still some, I mean, a little bit of tension there as well. But one one of the highlights of the college there was a there was um, two students in the class going through I think it was church history one of the classes, but um, one was Hopi, one was Navajo. But it was it was neat for them to share a little bit of their um, their tension um, between each between the the tribes and um, but also to work through that as well to to find uh, reconciliation through that too. But yeah, and they were also roommates. <laughs> a few year, a few years ago, we had a student who was half Navajo, half Hopi. She actually works in the same ministry. Yeah. I used to teach her. She's a walking Civil War. Yeah, walking Civil gets along War. Yeah. yeah, back to the question on diversity. We've had clo- almost 60 different tribes in the history of the school, but it's still only 10% of the federally recognized tribes yeah. in, in the country. Yeah. But that, that sense of diversity where and we, we're really an international when you consider all these different Native nations mm-hmm. that are represented in the, in the student body. Yeah. So. But I think the one thing that excites me, too, about, about the college is, is to be able to be at the forefront of the racial divide, you know, that a college that Navajos, Hopis can work together, yeah. that uh, Native people and uh, white folks can work together. Um, I, I mean, I do pray for a Native president someday, but I do appreciate us working together because most Native peoples have, have, have not seen healthy partnership between Native person and, 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 and a white person as well, too, so, yeah. Yeah. Is there a difference in how you would reach, like, I walk through the streets in Minneapolis, all Native American? Is it a very different approach there than what you do in the, in the rest? Or? Yeah. So I can only speak for the Navajos on this area, on this area, but I know um, in 2020 there was um, a census going around that I know there was 60, a little over 60,000 Navajos living in in the valley here. 
Um, so there's, yeah, there is quite a bit living off the reservation right now, um, and I think that's probably the case too in, in most tribes, only because of job opportunities and and and, and all of that too. Um, but yeah, I think um, the way you would approach a, a native person living off the res is is, is very different um, in some ways. Um, the the reservation uh, evangelism would definitely take um, a lot of more uh, more patience and time. I think. Biggest, the biggest thing in common would be just building that trust. Uh, we, we've always shared for a native to come to, a, to, to, to faith is similar to a Muslim coming to faith. And I think either, whether you're on or off the reservation, that trust is so key. Um, um, just building that relationship and so forth. But I think, yeah, uh, on the reservation, um, taking things slower. Um, I wouldn't quite dress this way when I'm, when I'm on the reservation um, because coming from living off the res now, I've been living in Flagstaff since 2006, um, uh, they kind of see natives. I was talking to um, our brother here about this. Um, they would see me as more of like, oh, you think you're better than us because you're living in the city now. So I would, I would really approach that just with, with a lot of um, patience and, and uh, so forth. One study said actually three quarters of Native Americans across the country live off reservation primarily, but you're not going to reach them on the weekend because they typically live within a half day's drive of their home reservation. And so the Navajos or Phoenix, Albuquerque, maybe LA, but off the, usually at least once a month, if not almost every weekend, they're going back home to see family. So the so a lo, local urban Native churches actually really struggle because they reside there during the week for work. But then, they're, but then they're heading back to the reservation. And so that, there's, there is a challenging dynamic there from, a, from an urban Native ministry perspective. Yeah. yeah, but some of the cities in America that have the most Native populations, number one is uh, Los Angeles, and uh, second, uh, New York City. And I think, I, w I would never have thought of that, but, yeah. but those cities have high, high um, you know, with, uh, jo job opportunities and so forth. I've known some some uh, some friends back in the 90s. They've they've gone to Mongolia, and uh, most recent too, some some students, some teams have that have gone to Mongolia. And uh, the biggest thing they talk about too, yeah, is some of the customs that that we shared uh, together. Um, the Mongolians see native peoples as as a, a, an extension of, of them too. That we're, we're tribal people. Probably the biggest thing that they really relate with Navajos is the is the yurts, which which is similar to the to the hogans and. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I've, I've, I've just seen um, several uh, Navajos talk about their trip there and how just well received they are there. And um, not, not, not only some of the language, but just their, the food that they eat too. Navajos, we, we love sheep and mutton. And uh, so when we go there, it's like just going back home as well. So, um, but yeah, they, 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 there's a lot of connection as well there too. Um, when I went to France in um, uh, 2019, uh, we, we worked with some uh, refugees that were from Syria, um, North Africa. They were they they were from the Muslim community, but um, uh, they came up to us after we, we did a we did a presentation in the park and just that connection as well. Um, they 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 came up to us and um, you know we, we talked about Jesus, but they they were just like you know we we, we connect with you guys because of of, of your story of of the story of. of of, uh, of suffering, and uh, so it was. It was interesting in that way as well. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. How much is language challenge to your efforts? How much is language? Um. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, right now, um, most tribes are losing losing their language. Um, again, I can just speak for for Navajo. Um, most Navajos, we're, we're, uh, we we do know our language and speak our language, but it is on it is on the decline. So generally speaking, most tribes are losing their language. So right now, it's it's it, I I mean, most tribes do speak English. So I, I haven't gone to a place where it's it's only 
you know, their local language. But um, there's a lot of, what, what, what's the, and you talked about the youth population on the rise, too. So they speak a lot of English. Yeah, one, um, you know, there's the loss of language, the Navajo Reservation. If you're over the age of 50, Navajo is probably your, your first language. If you're under the age of 30, you probably don't even speak it. Um, and for us, because English is the common language in all these different tribes, there's no way to do what we, what we would do in all the, all the different languages, and many of the young people don't even speak their language. And we realized a number of years ago when we were requiring um, Greek and Hebrew, we couldn't figure out why our students had no desire to study Greek and Hebrew. We realized there was actually kind of a, a sense of guilt or responsibility of not knowing their own language. Studying an, an ancient biblical language didn't resonate. When, and so we actually have, as part of our curriculum now, a commitment to helping students learn their own language. One young lady who came from Muscogee Creek in Oklahoma didn't know her language. We helped her study it. She went back, actually, for, and started working in language retention with her tribe there in Oklahoma for the sake of the gospel. It's a beautiful beautiful uh, story. So that, that's a part of, because language is so central to culture, if you lose your language, you're losing part of the culture. However, it's still an oral culture, not a literacy-based one. So learning is concrete, not abstract, right? Literacy-based cultures can learn abstractly, he, hear somebody talk about it, read it in a book, conceptualize it, maybe go live it out. Orality-based cultures is all concrete, show me, and then train me, <laughs> very tactile. And so our educational model is very much about modeling, not just teaching, and showing and doing with the students, not just talking, talking at them, as you might find in, in oftentimes a traditional college. So that's a huge part of that. I think I think it's um, I think it's more of a, more of an isolated situation. Yeah, but I think um, I've I've known some missionaries who have gone there. In fact, Mike Mike Hendricks, who's who's a one, he's a missionary here. He's he's learned learned a language as well. And um, but I think I think it's I think it's more more of an isolated situation. So generally speaking, I think I think seeing your desire, your heart, knowing that you're coming in as a learner, I think I think is the biggest thing. Most tribes are going to be open to that. But I think. The wrong approach, you know, as far as like I'm going to teach you, so I'm, then then I need I need you to teach me your language forcefully. I think is is, is a very wrong approach too. Yeah. So, but I think learning language is so so important. shared kind of some some things like uh, pointers of you know working with native peoples one is just is it's just to love the people you know love them right where they are um, we, we talked about lament too, being able to lament with, with, with native peoples I think the church uh, we, 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 we don't know how to lament well in, in America but being able to empathize with 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 uh, native peoples as well being able to listen in that way too and um, so we're out of time. Um, we're, we'd like to invite you to visit our campus there in Flagstaff. If you, if, if, right now, you probably don't want to leave here, but in the summer, you want to be our direction. Everybody's coming our direction, plan for extra time, uh, <laughs> coming up the hill. Um, but we give a lot of campus tours, and if you come on a Tuesday morning, you can join us for chapel and worship with uh, our student population uh, and staff as well. Uh, we have a table out here kind of on the end of the corner if you want to go by and meet some more students or get some information and just get connected in those ways. And if you want introductions to any of these folks, be glad to help make that happen. I wonder if one of you might be willing to just close, and close us in prayer and pray for 
this vision to come to pass, that Native America would have healthy, thriving Native leaders leading uh, thriving churches that they can themselves someday send missionaries all around the world. So anybody want to volunteer to do that? Thank you, sir. one bride. Lord, you are giving us an opportunity to understand how to work together. Lord, we don't know how much longer we're going to wait, but we do know, as Dr. Darrell said last night, there are sheep that are not in your sheepfold yet. So Lord, we pray for every man, woman, and child Lord, that we would be faithful witnesses because you have people that you have chosen before the foundation of the earth and they will be part of your bride. So we pray that we would lift each other up and be faithful followers in Jesus' name. Thank you for being with us.